Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be together this morning with you as a church. I, I never want to lose opportunities as a pastor uh, to communicate our affection for you, our gratefulness for you. Um, Aaron and I and Bart are so honored to be members with you in this church. Uh, even if we weren't pastors, it would be a privilege to be a member of this church as we are. And, and as pastors, it's our joy to commend you as a church for your faithfulness to love God's word, to love the gospel, to love each other. I was part of a little group that was helping somebody move yesterday. And every time that happens in our church, I'm, I'm just reminded again of what a gift it is to have people that are willing to serve, to give up hours, to labor, to love one another, to have a sore back for the sake of their brothers and sisters in Christ. So, so thank you for all of the ways that you serve each other. It really is a, an evidence of God's work in you, and we love you for it. So please receive that affection this morning. And if you would, open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. Uh, I, I'm just personally loving this book uh, as we've studied it at depth. Obviously, it's a, it's a favorite of many Christians, but it's a joy to study it slowly, to meditate, to marinate in it. And I wanted to read a couple of verses uh, previous that we were looking back now months ago that we were benefited from these verses and then lead us into our passage this morning, which will be in chapter 5. Uh, just to receive again some of the joyous verses that we've looked at previously this morning. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now work in the sons of disobedience, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them." Verse 4, chapter 1 says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now we've said repeatedly that this book is divided basically in half. The first part is declarations of what God has done in Christ, in individuals, and in gathering him to a body in the church to proclaim his worth in this universe and to the angelic world, the glorious mystery of his gospel. And the second half of the book is the imperative, the command section, the implications of what does it look like in daily life for Christians to reveal that they have encountered the gospel of Jesus Christ. What does union with Jesus look like on a daily basis in our relationships and in our lifestyle? And that's where we find ourselves in this particular verse this morning. We're in that second half where Paul is just walking through, giving commands. Here's what it looks like to reveal that you have been united to Jesus Christ in salvation. So let's look down there uh, at verse 7, verse 7 of chapter 5. Therefore, do not associate with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Recently, we've had an epidemic of light bulb death in our house. It has been a tragedy as often as I've tried recently to repair some of these, replace some of these light bulbs, and then a fresh batch 
went out, so I, I think it's, an, it's catching, apparently, uh, the light bulbs in our house. And um, it's interesting to me because even though I know certain light bulbs are out, I'm so used to uh, light bulbs being on in certain rooms in the house that recently I, I walked into one of the rooms, I knew the light bulb was out, I knew it needed to be replaced, and I just flipped the switch on, and it took me a, a longer than it should have to try to comprehend something didn't happen that should have just happened. <laughs> I'm standing there in the dark, and it took, oh, oh, the light bulb is out. That's what the problem is. I'm slow, I guess. I, I walked in, flipped the light on. There's no light. Why is there no light? Where does the light come from? It comes from the light bulb. The light bulb is dead. Okay, I need to fix the light bulb. It was a process. Maybe I was sleepy. I don't know. Often, we have that experience when a light bulb will die, and we are so used to its function that it almost surprises us for it not to function as light. And obviously, light bulbs are inanimate objects. Paul's concern in this passage is that there not be an epidemic of lightless Christians. He's concerned that Christians who don't burn out in that sense, they are made eternally light bearers because of their union with Jesus Christ, that they not intentionally submerge their light into darkness. You don't switch out a Christian, but a Christian has the ability, the choice of intentionally deluminating their life by practicing darkness. You could think of it this way. If a light bulb had a choice when that light is switched to shine darkness or light, the purpose of it is to shine light. But if it had a choice to shine darkness, how frustrating would that be? Not today, darkness today. Your job is to shine with light. Well, that's exactly what Paul is saying spiritually to the Ephesian church. He's saying your, your job is to be light. You are light, he says. You have been made light. And obviously the light here in reference is not just facial complexion or the brightness of your smile. It is moral conduct. It is godliness. It is essentially, Paul saying, shine with the godliness you have in Christ, the godliness in Christ that is your calling, and do not participate in the darkness of sin. He's exhorting Christians, shine with the godliness in Christ. And do not participate in the darkness of sin. There's a, an emphasis on this metaphor of light and darkness. Paul is this wonderful writer, and he uses this very understandable, very clear, tangible metaphor. There's light and there's darkness. You are light, and you are not to be darkness any longer. That's his essential claim. Be the light God has made you in Christ. Shine with godliness in Christ and do not participate in the darkness of sin. That's what he's saying. Now, there's, there's essentially a number of phrases here that are somewhat like a psalm where they're saying the same thing, but just looking at it with different angles, different accents. But I, I think we can break this up into two general categories. The first few verses emphasize our relationship to the sinful world, and the next few verses emphasize our relationship to sinful works themselves. So if I was going to try to organize, there's a lot of repetition here, there's overlap, but basically our relationship to sinful, to the sinful world and our relationship to the sinful works will give us some categories uh, to walk through this with. So let's, let's begin there in verse 7 with our relationship to the sinful world. We want to remember the context here. Uh, if you were here last week, and you can look above in your Bibles, even if you weren't, Paul has been talking especially about uh, immoral lifestyle and how prevalent that is in the culture, and how that is not to be prevalent at all in the church, not even to be named among you, he says. And then he continues in that same vein on the morality, the calling of the Christian, and he says, therefore, in light of the fact that this, this immorality in the world, he says in verse 6, is going to be judged before God, in light of the judgment that's coming on that kind of immorality, don't you associate that word could be partner with them. Don't you do it. So he's describing how does a Christian relate to a sinful world. Now, an important caveat here. 
Paul is, other than Jesus, the greatest example of a witness to the world, a, a friend to sinners that we have in the New Testament. Other than Jesus, Paul is the greatest example we have in that. So Paul is not saying, uh, do not associate in any way. In the context, he's saying, don't partner with them in their pursuit of sin. That's what he's saying. Don't be a partner to pagans pursuing sin. When there's a darkness party, don't you be a part of it. It's essentially what he's saying. When all the light bulbs are shining forth with darkness, don't you join them, he says. Do not associate with them. There is no partnership of light with darkness, Paul would say. There is no association, no sharing. That word could be sharing, actually. It's to partake with. Don't partake with pagans as they pursue the darkness of sin. And he gives some reasons why that should be the case. Well, you once were that way, but now you have been made light in the Lord. You see those words down there in your Bibles? Now you are. It's interesting it doesn't say you, sh- you shine with light or you, you have works that are light. He's saying you are light. This is essential to your identity. Your identity has been remade in Christ. You were made to shine with godliness. You are light In the Lord, though through our union with Christ and salvation, a transformation of identity has taken place, and you are light in the Lord. If you tried to shine with darkness, you are going back to the former way of life, death in sin, that was part of your life historically, but has encountered a transformation when you came to see Jesus Christ, and you had that moment of seeing him on the cross, suffering for your sin, and dying in your place, and your eyes were open, and you saw the the great grievousness of sin before the holiness of God and the greatness of God's glory and your heart was transformed and instead of hating Jesus, you love Jesus and now you're to shine for him. At one time you were darkness, but now, now you have a new identity. Now you are light in the Lord. So, he says, walk as children of light. Walk as children of light. And in, in the biblical thinking, children, it's not just this um, ran, random, I happen to be born to somebody. The, the idea here is that you take on the family resemblance. You take on the family job even. You bear the family marks. You uh, live up to the family standard. That's what's packed into this idea of children. Your children of light reveal your heritage, Paul is saying. Reveal your ancestry. Reveal the one who gave birth to you, he would say. The one who created you. Reveal who you are. Your children of light, walk that way. Walk is a very important word in the book of Ephesians. It has to do with this, a style of life. Let your way of life be light. Be revealing that you're children of light. And then he makes it explicit so that they're very clear. The fruit of light, the fruit of those who have been made light in the Lord is found in all that is good and right and true. And then he adds to that, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. When we put that together, we're basically understanding a definition of this metaphor of light. It is godliness. It is goodness. That could be a kind of generosity towards others, righteousness, moral uprightness, and truth as opposed to falsehood. And to understand the motive here, it is, it is living life with our main intention to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. If, if you could think of a, a son of a silly illustration, but imagine a conveyor belt with just life rolling towards you. And every item that comes is a choice. Every new moment that comes is a choice. And he's saying the Christian stands there with this calling to shine in the Lord Jesus Christ with godliness. And each moment of life, he's choosing yes, no, yes, no. And the test of what causes him to say yes or no, is what will be pleasing to the Lord. And based on these character traits, we could say what is pleasing to the Lord is that which reflects the Lord. 
Good, right, true, those could be descriptions of God's character, God's moral character, his truthfulness, his moral uprightness, his goodness and generosity, his self-sacrificing love. He's not selfish or demeaning or hateful of others. He's loving and kind and gracious and holy and pure. And so what Paul's saying is, your manner of life as it relates to this sinful world, should be to choose every moment that which you can discern is pleasing to the Lord. Now, this is not cultivating some kind of radical, subjective, um, kind of moment by moment, does God want me to stand up or sit down? When I was a kid, um, I, I was uh, a what you might call a hyper-legalist. I've never met anybody that was as hyper-legalistic as I was. And I was not only legalistic, I was also fully uh, desirous of being charismatic as well. And so I was convinced that God would tell me things and that I should or shouldn't do them. I mean, silly things like don't open your eyes, close your eyes, don't, you know. I mean, it was it's amazing I'm sane, okay? But, but, but I actually thought that as far as I could tell, this is God wanted me to do, be totally still. So I try to be totally still. And, and this is silly kinds of things, right? So what, what, what Paul does here is he makes it clear. Look, th- this is not that you wonder, sh- should, I, should I wake up or not wake up? Uh, should, I, should I buy the, the Accord or the Toyota? Or maybe I shouldn't buy, or maybe buy. No, no. We, we live life making what you might call amoral choices all the time. That's just a part of life in God's creation. There's not not a rightfulness or a wrongfulness on the face of it to be an engineer or a doctor or a pastor or a missionary. There's not a rightfulness or a wrongfulness if you like the blue car, the red car, or cereal or yogurt for breakfast. These are amoral kinds of choices. The point is the heart that drives our choices should be we want to please the Lord. And what's clearest here is those character expressions that are contrary to God's character should be discarded by the Christian. And in context, those opportunities to partner with or associate with the pagan world in what they consider normal or commonplace, we should consider inappropriate and unacceptable. Our relationship to a sinful world is we will not participate, no matter how commonplace, no matter how normal, no matter what the cultural backlash is, we will not participate in anything that shines with darkness contrary to the light that is Christ Jesus that we have been united to. Do not associate, walk as children of light, Here's the fruit of light, he says. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. When I was a, a teenager, there's this shirt. I don't know, some cool kind of Christian culture shirt. It had a fish, like the Christian fish, and it was swimming one way, and there was all these gruesome-looking fishish things swimming the other way, and it said, go against the flow. And it was this really awesome Christian T-shirt that I would wear, and sure was... Give me great style points with all the kids, uh, but that's what I would wear. And, and there is a, a functional truth in that. The Christian lifestyle does go against the flow. Actually, the Christian lifestyle is probably even less cool than wearing that T-shirt was. There is a contrast with the pursuits of a pagan world and the pursuits of a Christian. I was recently listening to a friend of mine, Craig Cavanis. He was just giving some counsel to pastors, and he was talking about how important it is for Christians to appreciate the reality that we are exiles and not insiders in this world. That's the biblical definition. We are exiles and not insiders insiders. And in our country, this is a particularly important lesson right now because there has been something of the illusion of being insiders for 
a couple of hundred years actually, there's been an unusual reprieve from cultural antagonism to Christian moralism and faith and ethics and loves and passions. There's been an unusual level of accommodation, even affirmation of a Christian lifestyle in our country. Well, that seems to be rapidly changing. But the biblical testimony is that's unusual, not bad, and should be uh, um, a, a, an occasion for gratefulness for every Christian, not bad. But, but not normal. N- normally, our experience and our expectation should be that the cultural way of living is contrasted with the Christian way of living. Not, not in that we wear different kinds of clothing and, you know, well, if they have this kind of haircut, I'm going to have this. No, no, those things are irrelevant. The point is the heart direction is going into opposite directions. There is no no, uh, association with light and darkness, Paul is saying. We need to take this seriously and settle ourselves in for the reality that we serve a different Lord than those that do not follow Jesus. And in our heart, there is a magnet that still exists that tugs us in that direction. It's old, it's dead in Christ, but it pulls on us. We crave association, compatibility, similarity. We don't like accusation, demeaning, being different. And yet there is a fundamental heart level difference between our old way of life and the new way of life. We have to settle into the reality of that. I love this quote by John Stott. I've, I've quoted it before in Ephesians. It's good to come back to it. He says, we must allow the word of God to confront us, to disturb our security, to undermine our complacency, and to overthrow our patterns of thought and behavior. We must allow the word of God to confront us, to disturb our security. What a provoking phrase. To undermine our complacency and to overthrow our patterns of thought and behavior. P.T. O'Brien, the commentator, says this, it is all too easy, all too easy for believers to be influenced by the surrounding world and to succumb to its ways of thinking and behaving. The result is that what is acceptable to the culture of the day becomes acceptable in the church. We must become familiar with the idea that our moral standards are not just different, they are despised. They are not just distinctive, they are rendered hateful by the surrounding culture. That to choose to not participate in a pagan party of darkness is not simply odd, it is offensive. This is the normal way of life for Christians around the world and we must be familiar with it. Without running to the false ledge of pride in condemnation of those who are exactly like us. We must stand our ground at the foot of the cross and remember that we follow a crucified Savior. How do we partner with the sinful world? What are some examples? Well, we partner with the sinful world when we participate in an atmosphere of crude joking. Certainly, when we associate with a non-Christian and any immorality. We partner with the sinful world when we agree with a business partner to cheat our customers or our shareholders. We partner with the sinful world when we agree with a tax professional to get away with dishonesty on our taxes. We partner with the sinful world when we join in gossip or slander on Facebook or Twitter. We partner with a sinful world when we engage in emotional or physical immoral relationships with someone else. We partner with a sinful world when we join in dishonoring leaders and public officials that the Bible calls us to honor. That's 
partnering, that's associating, that's going with the flow of darkness. And it is easy. It's like those lazy rivers they have at the water park. You just get in your tube and you float. It takes no effort. Darkness flows. Light fights. You have to fight to retain the light of godliness that is our calling in Christ Jesus. A relationship to a sinful world, one of disassociation with love and gratefulness, friendliness, but no association with the party of darkness. Secondly, our relationship to sinful works. Paul makes a, a, a slight change in emphasis, although it's all very related here, a slight change in emphasis when he says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. It is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. It's possible, I think, in the Christian church to have this idea that as long as I don't go to the party, I'm being a faithful Christian. Well, this verse just removes, <laughs> removes that category. He, he says, look, it, it's not enough if you're a light to simply not join in the party of darkness. You have to actually despise being dark in any moment. It, it's not just the way of life or as long as I just removed, I don't associate with them. No, no, it, it's works of darkness themselves that should be, be repugnant to the Christian. It, it's not just association. Sometimes it's, it's fascinating how Christians, and, and myself is included in this, we can have this sort of condescending uh, view towards the culture, the world, they do these things. And then we go home and we're impatient with our child. And somehow there's not a relationship. We, we can, on the one hand, think, man, I can't believe the kind of immorality that is. I mean, that is disgusting. And you go home, don't you do that again. Or we, we decry the, the sort of uh, immorality present in the culture and media. Oh, media is terrible. It's a terrible thing. I hate, it was on TV today. It's just awful, horrendous thing. And then, then you have your private moment of temptation. Or, or, or you decry racism in a, in a sort of a, a general way. I, I just I hate racism. It's so terrible that that happened. But, but then privately you talk about, man, this person of whatever background or culture, I'm not sure I feel comfortable around them. I prefer people who are more like me. It's important that Christians not stop merely at the don't party with the darkness and also ask, how do I view the works of darkness individually and in my own life? What Paul's saying is, don't, don't have community with the works of darkness. It's not just like a, a, a fellowship connection. As long as I fellowship with people that, that don't party in darkness, I, I'm, I'm good. No, no, no. The, the works, the individual works of darkness are repugnant to us as well. I mean, to use the silly example again, it's not like I haven't been to a, a dark light bulb party in ages. Yes, but... What were you like on Wednesday afternoon? Were you shining with godliness? Or were the works of darkness coming out of you? Don't fellowship, not just with pagans, but with the works of darkness, he says to us. Don't do it. Don't do it. You're made to be light in the Lord Jesus. Don't do it with the works of darkness. And instead, he says, expose them. And then he has this, I think, somewhat confusing couple of verses. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. Anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now, let me do my best to try to explain this. Uh, even the commentators are a little bit confused about these verses. Um, it could mean, exposing could mean uh, confrontation and the gift of confrontation in the Christian community. Think of things like church discipline and, and, and confronting a fellow believer in sin. 
personally, although that's a biblical category in other verses, I don't think that's what this is talking about. It also could mean the sort of prophetic voice of the church that speaks to the culture and declares sin to be sin and righteousness to be righteousness. There's other parts in Scripture that commend that. Again, I don't think that's what this is talking about. Those are some options. Here's what I think it's talking about. I think because it's referring to the works and not to the people, it's exposing the works, right? Expose the works. I think these works, what, what they're talking about here is bringing these works into the light of Jesus and what he's done. It's an examination of the works. It's basically seeing them in the right light. If I could use a, a sort of a, a common phrase. It's seeing them in light of Jesus. How does this particular work look in light of Jesus? I think that's what exposing them means. It means taking a work that normally and often is done in darkness without any kind of moral consideration and bringing it in light of Jesus. How does this work look? Don't partner with the works of darkness. Why? Well, because you are united to Jesus Christ, the light. So what do we do with these works? We bring them into the light of Christ and we evaluate them in light of who Jesus is and what he's done. How do we think about this work? Don't let them function in the security of darkness in your own heart or as you evaluate the culture or as you think about others. Let works be evaluated in light of Jesus. Expose them in that way. And not only is doing that turning an upside down world right side up, a dark world into light, we see right as right and wrong as wrong, but it also has this potential, I think, embedded in this verse for transformation as well. That's, I think, what's coming through in this verse. Anything that is exposed to the light becomes visible for anything that becomes visible is light. Now, he's not trying to be a physicist here, okay? I mean, what he's trying to get to is the metaphor. When you take something out of darkness and you bring it into light, all of a sudden it's light in the sense that you can now see it. And for a person whose works are brought into the light of Christ, in reality, there is also the potential that they can be transformed like we were. I think that's the reason he quotes uh, this, this section where he says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. That, that's probably a compilation of Old Testament verses. Where he's, he's saying, this is what happens to unbelievers all the time. They're brought into the light of Jesus. In light of Jesus, their true identity, their, the true nature of their works is exposed and revealed. But it's not just exposed. It also has this potential to be transformed from those that are in the grave to those that are resurrected, from those that were darkness to those that are light. So what's our relationship to sinful works? Well, we view them in light of Christ, and in that process, there is the potential for reformation, just as there was for us when we came out of darkness and encountered the voice and the light of Christ calling us out of the grave and shining on us with the illumination of his grace. What is our relationship to sinful works? Bring them in the light of Christ. Expose them. Sin thrives in secret. It thrives on assumption. It thrives on ignoring. It thrives in presumption. It dies at the foot of the cross. It dies when we consider it in light of Jesus. And for the person who brings their works to Jesus and honestly considers them in light of who he is and what he has done, there is the potential that they will hear the voice, awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. In that same way, both those parts of our hearts that remain in sin and people whose whole lifestyle has to be brought before Jesus are able to be transformed from darkness to light. What about sinful works that are present in you and in me? If you're like me, one of the most 
stubborn aspects of sin is its ability to minimize itself in my perspective, to justify itself in my perspective. I sin (laughs) relatively to everyone else's sin in my own mind. Well, my anger is really nothing in comparison to the disobedience of this particular child. Or my self-righteousness is really nothing in comparison to the... uh, selfishness of my spouse in this situation, or my impatience is nothing in comparison to the selfishness of these people on the road right now. It's all minimized by relativizing it to others. And yet when you take sin and place it in light of Jesus, the crucified Savior, the reality of it is seen. The reality of that work is seen. How serious is that outburst of anger? Well, serious enough to put Jesus on the cross. How glorious is living in peaceful kindness and self-sacrificing love? Well, as glorious as reflecting the risen Savior who laid down his life for us. Our lifestyle is seen in its proper light when we take it before Jesus and who he is and what he done, what he has done, and, and it helps us to, to live in keeping with his reality. So let me encourage you to do that right now. What's a, what's a sinful work that you're tempted to partner with? Actually, the word there is, is similar to koinonia, fellowship. You fellowship with. What's a sinful work that you're tempted to fellowship with? It's a welcomed part of your daily life. Identify one. Self-righteousness? Is it impatience? Is it internal grumbling? Is it laziness? Is it addiction to some comfort that helps you escape a difficult week? What is it? What, what, what is it, that dark work that you're tempted to fellowship with? Let's take it right now and examine it in light of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. It means it's more serious than we think about it on Wednesday afternoon or Friday morning or Thursday night. It's more serious. But it also means there's a solution for it. And there is forgiveness for it. And in union with him, there is a light of godliness that we can replace it with. So we take selfishness and in light of Jesus Christ on the cross, we replace it with goodness because our selfishness is forgiven. And in union with him, we can reflect him in servant-hearted benevolence towards others rather than self-centeredness. We take anger and wrath and judgment And we change them out for mercy because we're united to Jesus Christ who died for sinners. We take pride and we change it out for humility. I would encourage you to do that right now. What work comes to mind? I I guarantee you probably the one you should focus on is on your mind. (laughs) It's not unique to you. We're all thinking of similar things. But the delightful truth of this passage is the promise and the calling is God has given you this privileged calling. It's hard work because darkness tugs. It pulls at us. And yet we can come to the foot of the cross and see that's the true nature of this no big deal sin. That's the true nature of it. That's the true work I'm partnering with. I can't be united to Jesus and united to the things that put him on the cross. I can't be living for Jesus and living for the things that he died for. I can't be loving Jesus and loving other things that condemn Jesus because my sins were placed on him. No, no, I can't do that. But what I can do is I can love this one who died for my sin and I can live for him. I can walk as a child of light. Consider the privilege of this. You've been made to reflect the glory of God on earth. 
That's your calling. That's your purpose. It's more important than anything else. Your comfort, your desires, your preferences. You've been made to reflect the glory of God on earth. The glory that comes to you as one united to a crucified and risen Savior. We have been made to shine with godliness and to not participate in the darkness of sin. We've been remade. We've been saved to do that. Four good works which God prepared in advance that we should walk in them. You were brought from death to life, from condemnation to salvation, from hopeless to hopeful, from orphan to child. You were brought and now walk as children of light. Let's walk and keep walking. Let's not partner even with the smallest expression of sinful work. Let's not associate even with the most culturally normal association of pagan pursuit of darkness. Let's walk as children of light, reflecting the light of the world who came down into darkness and was extinguished on the cross that we might live. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we rejoice in the forgiveness of every sin, the forgiveness that you paid for in full. We rejoice that no matter what our history, Lord, we can come to you and receive that forgiveness freshly and freely. Lord, your mercies are new every morning. And Lord, in in light of your delightful gospel, Lord, we want to search out those pockets of darkness that are still present, those works that we have compromised towards and with. And and we, we, we want to illuminate every corner of our life with the glory of our union with you, every pocket of our life. Lord, we want there to be be no pockets of darkness, Lord. Turn them all on in the light of your glory, Lord. Let there be let there be no leftover lingering pockets pockets of compromised darkness in our hearts, Lord. Grow us to shine more and more gloriously for you until the day when you return and make us perfect as you are perfect. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.